but we've been singing that hymn. We've just been asking the Lord to speak to us in the stillness. And uh, we are aware of the messages that we have had in the past years and especially ones we've had at Camp Woody. If you recall, that God's voice is to be understood and received through various different agencies. And one of them is God's discerning God's voice in nature. And uh, here we are now. And uh, this morning as I was walking through nature, the thought struck me that many people have difficulty, maybe even the children, you know. I asked the question last night, um, can you see God as Moses saw him? He saw him, see, he saw the invisible. Can you hear him through nature? What is he saying? How can I actually recognize his voice? And, um, there is one quote from the Spirit of Prophecy that tells us when your soul inside of you is silent, then the silence makes his voice more distinct. And so my purpose this Sabbath is to seek God's guidance in helping us to see him and to hear him, recognizing him. And the first thing is to bring ourselves into silence of my soul. And this we can do for a period of time in nature. There is nothing but silence. But then in the silence, something begins to happen inside of my mind. Something drops into the mind because it is now not permitting all sorts of thoughts to toss around in the brain. All the different voices that keep on affecting my brain. A person who is having struggles with um, psychological difficulties uh, hears voices in his brain. And uh, to them, the voices of the thoughts in the mind become so loud that it's like a voice. But most of us have thoughts running around in our mind frequently. And there's no peacefulness, there's no rest, there's all sorts of thoughts running around. And which one of those thoughts is actually from God and which ones are from stress and from troubles with different situations and what people have said and what the world is saying? We need to discern the voice of God. We need to recognize the voice of God. And so it is... Uh, it is a valuable thing to spend this time in contemplating this. Be still, it says in Psalm 46, verse 6. Be still and know that I am God. So as we uh, seek to understand this, that nature is able to communicate with us things which we need to understand. God will speak to us through nature. And I want to read this here. In um, Christ Object Lessons, page 107, 
Christ Object Lessons, page 107. I read here these beautiful realities that are available to us in nature that was available to Moses. By many, man's wisdom is thought to be higher than the wisdom of the divine teacher. And God's lesson book is looked upon as old-fashioned, stale, and uninteresting. But by those who have been vivified by the Holy Spirit, it is not so regarded they see the priceless treasures and would sell all to buy the field that contains it. I read paragraph 6, but let me read paragraph 5. There are wonderful truths in nature. What are in nature? Wonderful truths are in nature. The earth, the sea, and the sky are full of truth. They are teachers. Nature utters her voice in lessons of heavenly wisdom and eternal truth. Did you notice that? Nature, among which we are here seated and contemplating, has wonderful truths in it. The earth, the sea, and the sky are full of truth. They are our teachers. Nature utters her voice in lessons of heavenly wisdom and eternal truth. So, this is the point. We need to actually experience this. And that's what my burden is. That we actually experience this speaking of God in nature. Shall we uh, read the next words? It says, But fallen man will not understand. What's that? As these truths are brought to us in nature, fallen man will not understand. Isn't it, isn't it true? Do you, have you understood nature, children? Hmm? Have you understood God speaking in nature? Have you seen God? Have you seen the truths in nature? How many of us have had difficulty in that? Because we are fallen. And God is speaking to us in nature, but we don't understand. It goes on to say, Sin has obscured the, his vision, and he cannot of himself interpret nature without placing it above God. This is interesting. What has sin done? That you cannot, you cannot, uh, it has obscured your vision. In other words, God is right in front of you and your vision can't see him. Sin has obscured your vision. And here's the answer why Moses spent time in the wilderness to actually come to see God face to face, as we read. He had to deal with the obstruction of his own sinful nature. But when he stopped and spent that time then he could rightfully look at nature and 
in, and correctly see God in it. Correct lessons cannot impress the minds of those who reject the word of God. The teaching of nature is by them so perverted that it turns the mind away from the Creator. And it's very interesting that the pagans actually worship the gods of, the, of nature. They worship nature itself. That's where pantheism comes from. And, uh, and that is because fallen man isn't looking at these things aright. And so this poses before our mind a very serious consideration. If God is visible in nature around me, if I can hear his voice and I can sense his presence, what must happen that I can actually see the invisible in nature around me? This is for us to consider very carefully and while we spend our weekend together, I'm praying that the Lord will actually break through the barrier that prevents us from seeing him as he really is around us in nature. And as I said in the last night, at the end I just want to ask you, have, what, has, what has become clear to you as you spend time in nature around you. And that comes back to th in the mornings. Please, children or adults, take your children. Don't just let them sit around the fireplace. Take your children and see whether you can help them and in the morning to just tune into God. Do it personally yourself and do it with your children so that we can begin to make a beautiful discovery that we've maybe never really made as much in the past. Remember, God is trying to lead us on step by step. So here I want to read from uh, the Fundamentals of Christian Education, uh, page 110, uh, as to dealing with this question of... Um, of recognizing God's voice in nature. Fundamentals of Christian Education. Reading there from page 110. And follow very attentively to the precious answers that are coming to us through this. There in paragraph 1 it says, the reason why we have no more men of great breadth and extended knowledge is because they trust to their own finite wisdom and seek to place their own mold upon the work in the place of having the mold of God. Isn't that interesting what we discussed in the Sabbath school this morning? That God has to lead them along and touch them in their own mold and finally bring them out into his mold. They do not earnestly pray and keep the communication open between God and their souls that they can recognize his voice. If I want to recognize God's voice in nature, what must happen inside of me? We, we touched it already. When the soul is still inside, when there is stillness within, when not all my own wisdom and my own clamorings of my own nature is all, uh, is, is re when it's not there, when it's pushed aside, it's not relevant. What I think is not relevant. That's my own voice speaking to me in my head. Uh, what I want to hear is God's voice speaking to me. So there must be silence in the soul. 
and that's what is so beautifully expressed here that um, that we must pray and keep the communication open between God and our soul otherwise we cannot recognize his voice and now comes a beautiful little statement here messengers of light will come to the help of those who feel that they are weakness itself without the guardianship of heaven now so this is not to disturb you when you feel you are so weak that you can't even think straight it's when a person feels like that that without the guidance of heaven I'm going to be all weakness and helplessness it's when that mentality has taken hold of me then I'm able to distinct, distinguish and recognize God's voice but while I'm in my own thoughts of my own wisdom and my own ideas I will come and you know the, the preacher says to you come on come and see God in nature and they go yeah I'm waiting I can't see anything you're talking about. You're just talking about your imagination. And this is how Satan comes to us and people speak to us. Oh, come on. You can't hear God in nature because their vision is obscured and our vision is obscured unless we are in this state of mind. I am total weakness. I can't bring anything to you, God, I need you to speak to me. And then in stillness of my own thought activities, just all laid down, just focusing on the stillness of God around me, I will begin to recognize him speaking to me. That is an important thing. Now, I want to you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 10. And there Jesus makes a beautiful statement in reference to the point that people who are keeping their minds open to him, communion with him by, by realizing their own weakness without the help of heaven. That they, those kind of people, Jesus regards as his sheep. Sheep are not like goats. Sheep are very blank. They need guidance. Whereas goats, oh, they know what they want to do. And that's why the Lord sorts out the sheep from the goats. Sheep are dependent on their shepherd's voice. If we read here in John chapter 10, verse 27. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of of my hand what a precious promise that is and I want to tell you personally that this promise I have stuck to and held to from my earliest years when my mother showed me this scripture this became dear to me at the age of about 12 13 my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And then I give them eternal life. Isn't that what we want? So if I want eternal life, I need to be a sheep that will hear his voice. And what do I need? I need to have an attitude of total helplessness and weakness if I'm going to recognize him. So I want to read here from manuscript releases. Volume 21, page 370. 
it says, It is not every heart that responds, but every heart may and can, if it will, respond to that love that is without a parallel. And this connects us with all our love messages we've been considering. Not every heart responds, but every heart may and can if it will respond to that love that is without a parallel. My sheep hear my voice, Christ said. A heart yearning for God will recognize the voice of God. God cannot respond to one soul that does not respond to his grace offered, his love bestowed. See how that connects with the previous statement? Only when we feel our absolute weakness that only heaven could help can we recognize God's voice. A heart yearning for God will recognize the voice of God. So sin has obliterated. But as I am aware of my sin and I'm aware of my weakness, if I, if I actually embrace that reality as an important ingredient in my walk with God, I will then begin to become aware and discern God's voice. I will then become a sheep of God, not a goat. I will hear the shepherd's voice and I will, because I am yearning for God. And as I'm yearning for God, he knows. He knows whether I'm yearning for God. And I was out there in nature this morning and Satan came with his suggestions. <laughs> you want God to listen to you? You want God to you want to hear God? <laughs> you can't hear him, can you? It's all just in your imagination. And um, as uh, as I dismissed that terrible voice that was coming to me, I just sensed my great need of the Lord. And uh, just stood there quietly in silence. And very, very slowly, the Lord drew near and reminded me of my past experience with him and of how he spoke to me here and there. And ah, he was starting to speak already. I could hear him. And then it con he connected it with the nature around. And by God's wonderful grace, my shepherd spoke to me and comforted me. So, what is it? It is a yearning for God that must be there if I'm going to hear his voice and discern it there in nature. I read also from that I may know him. That I may know him, page 52. Paragraph 4, it says, again, the quote from John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, says Jesus, and they follow me. The shepherd does of Israel does not drive his flock, but he leads them. His, his attitude is wholly one of invitation. My sheep hear my voice. If we are indeed sons and daughters of God, 
we not only hear, but recognize the voice above all others. We appreciate the words of Christ. We distinguish the truth as it is in Jesus from all error. And the truth refreshes the soul and fills it with gladness. Did you see another ingredient coming in here? If we are indeed sons and daughters of God, who are they? His sheep. Who are they? People who yearn for God. Who realize their sin and their utter weakness without guidance from heaven. It is these that will recognize the voice of God above all other voices because they're all around us. And there becomes, you become uh, capable of discriminating the different things that come to you and that may disturb your peace. Even in nature, things may disturb your peace especially man interfering with it, like a jet flying over. I never forget the day when I was still watching television uh, off and on in the past. There was this beautiful nature scene in a, in a park like this. And there was a man who was just trying to be alone in nature. And there was a, a bulldozer in the distance making noise. And he, he went there and left and got frustrated, went somewhere else. And they was just beginning to really tune in and overflew an aeroplane. And he pulled his hair out and he got wild. Because there were so many things that were interfering. And as I was seeing that, the Lord drew near and said, Can you see what you have to learn in, 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 in this world? You have to learn to shut out all the other voices and just focus on mine. And when I learned to do that, I remember the day when I was there doing my nurse's training and I, I spent lots of time in nature there. And uh, there I was just basking in the quietness of God's closeness. And there was the noise of some machinery. And the Lord drew close. And I had this deep sense <laughs> look, nature is more powerful than that sound. Because even with the sound of man's noise, if you're focusing and totally tuned into God, his nature is more powerful. It's only a distant sound. But all we need to do is to be in tune with him. Sons and daughters who are yearning to recognize his voice amongst all the others. I'll read it again. If we are indeed sons and daughters of God, we need only hear, we need not only hear, but recognize the voice above all others. We appreciate the words of Christ. We distinguish the truth as it is in Jesus from all error. And the truth refreshes the soul and fills it with gladness. So do you have trouble concentrating? Do you have trouble really being able to tune in to what God is doing amongst all the other sounds that come to you? You may distinguish the truth as it is in Jesus if you yearn for God if you crave for him and deliberately throw yourself upon God's wonderful love in your weakness. There were our people that are going to be saved who have never read the Bible. There are people who are going to be saved without ever hearing a preacher. In Ro Romans chapter 2 it says, they are the Gentiles 
who recognize God very close to them. And I want to read about them in Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages, page 638. Desire of Ages, page 638. You see, even pagans can be saved. Beautiful little quote, this one. It says... Those whom Christ commands in the judgment may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of the divine spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them, even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness. Before the words of life had fallen upon their ears, they have befriended the missionaries, even ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly. Those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Why? Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them where in nature and have done the things that the law required their works are evidence that the holy spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of god <laughs> We are greatly blessed. We have the knowledge of theology. <laughs> So-called in theology, but Sister White used the word right there. That the knowledge we have of God's word, we are richly blessed with. But And we sometimes think that there are people out there, those poor people out there, who have never heard what we know. How can they be saved? Well, they can be. Because they are the children of God when they, in their bereft condition, have a yearning for the great God that they can see is speaking to them in nature. The Red Indians. The Red Indians call him the great white spirit. They know he's out there. But not all the Red Indians are going to be saved. But those who actually submit to that God of nature, who actually listen quietly to God and are his children because they have a yearning for him, those people will be saved. Just like you and I. And it's this personal relationship with Jesus that is the primary the primary purpose of all knowledge of God's word we often become thrilled and excited about certain subjects look what I know here look what this truth is look at that and we highlight it as some fantastic discovery that only I know and that's where the the majority of Christian churches have fallen we are the great blessed ones who know it all and yet, there are people who don't know as much as they do who will be saved while they will be lost. Because the concentration is in the wrong direction. Just getting information and rejoicing in the information instead of rejoicing in a relationship with the God who wants to speak to us personally. 
an indwelling Christ. Which is the, what is the great mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, this is why children, you see, can you see that you are disturbed, little children? How everything mucks around in your little brain and you can't be still? Because you're not listening to God. And you get disturbed with all sorts of little things. Oh, my shoes aren't right, and this isn't right, and that isn't right. That's your problem, and adults have got other problems. They are not still, quiet, to listen to what God is saying. You see? So we want to be able to really understand how to find God speaking to us. And these heathen have discovered it. Amazing. I want to look for, I'm looking forward to those heathen to meet them one day when the earth made new. Remember it says in the Bible, in, um, in the small writings there of the prophets, the small prophets, uh, I think it's Zechariah, they'll say, what are these marks in your hand when they meet Christ? Well, didn't they know? No, they didn't. They never heard of Jesus with his marks in his hand, why they came from. And he has to tell them that was done to me in the house of what? My friends. <laughs> what well, good friends they are. <laughs> yeah, but these real friends, they are amazed that this has happened to him. But they remember what they learned in nature because nature demonstrates death and resurrection all the time. So, my communion with God in nature is so imperative. And let us read it again in uh, Desire of Ages, page 291. Desire of Ages, page 291. Here it, it reads in paragraph 1. In his training his disciples, Jesus chose to withdraw from the confusion of the city to the quiet of the fields and hills as more in harmony with the lessons of self-abnegation he desired to teach them. Here it is again. That's what he taught Moses in the discipline of the wilderness. He taught the disciples the same way because there in the wilderness in nature are the lessons of self-abnegation. And during his ministry... He loved to gather the people about him under the blue heavens on some grassy hillside or in the beach beside the lake. Here, surrounded by the works of his own creation, he could turn the thoughts of his hearers from the artificial to the natural in the growth and development of nature. Now, listen, this is where we are now getting some information, where we will actually be able to discern God. What? In the growth and development of nature were revealed the principles of his kingdom. And now we can start hearing, oh, the principles of God's kingdom are being taught me in nature. I'm now able to see the principles of heaven as I look and am, s and, and, and am distinguishing. As men should lift up their eyes to the hills of God and behold the wonderful works of his hands, they could learn precious lessons of divine truth. Christ's teaching would be repeated to them in the things of nature. So it is with all who will go into the fields with Christ in their hearts. They will feel themselves surrounded with a holy influence. 
the things of nature take up the parables of our Lord and repeat his counsels. By communion with God in nature, the mind is uplifted and the heart finds rest. And that was our scripture reading, wasn't it? The mountains and the little hills provide rest by righteousness. Wow. If you follow it very carefully now, your mind will be tuned to be able to actually see and hear God in nature. Because what are we looking for? If I'm really craving for the answers of life in my heart, then God will draw near to me. I am his child and he will speak to me. I can discern his voice. And what will I gain? Remember what we gained through the study of Moses? A sense of God's presence was continually with him. And the sense of God's presence is in nature around us. It says, as we go into the fields and the nature, they will feel themselves surrounded with a holy influence. The things of nature take up the parables of our Lord and repeat his counsels. By communion with God in nature, the mind is uplifted and the heart finds rest. I will see God because as I am experiencing the sense of his presence, which Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness to discover, it grew on him, it became part of him. And then he could go through the helter-skelter of the ridiculous experience with all the children of Israel and with Pharaoh and with all those things, and he could just calmly move on because he had the experience of God very close to him, face to face. Even in the negatives, he saw the Lord at work. So this beautiful camp out that we are having is a privilege that we need to take, and I'm so glad that we've made the effort to be here. Some people have said to me, oh, I don't think I need to go. And I just say nothing. I go, Lord, please. <laughs> we miss out on such precious things when we think church is only there for the going and all those other things are unnecessary. Everything that the church is engaging in is necessary for my soul. Because everything is specially coordinated by God to help us to make a closer relationship with him. I want to conclude with a quote from the book Education, page 100. Education, page 100. And here we read, On page 100, paragraph 1. In fact, this whole chapter is entitled God in Nature. And uh, this is a beautiful summary that I want us to take with us from this hour of divine service. It says... Upon all created things is seen the impress of the deity. Nature testifies of God. But remember, you can only get it if your mind is not uh, benighted by sin. The susceptible mind. Here it is. See how summarizing it is? The susceptible mind brought in contact with the miracle and mystery of the universe cannot but recognize the working of infinite power. 
the susceptible mind. What was that again? A mind that feels that sin obliterates my view, therefore I'm totally weak. I'm so weak unless the Lord helps me, I'm never going to see straight. And that mind is now susceptible. It's the mind of the sheep. It's the mind of the son, sons of God. They are now susceptible and they will recognize the working of infinite power. Not by its own inherent energy does the earth produce its bounties and year by year continue its motion around the sun. An unseen hand guides the planets in their circuit of the heavens. A mysterious life pervades all nature. A life that sustains the unnumbered world throughout immensity. That lives in the insect atom. Which floats in the summer breeze. That wings the flight of the swallow. And feeds the young ravens which cry. That brings the bud to blossom and the flower to fruit. Are you picking up how to discern God's voice in nature? How to see God in nature? Did you pick it up? You will realize that everything you are looking at is being sustained by God. An unseen hand is doing all that. So can you see now why Moses... Continued because he, was, he saw the invisible. Did you pick it up, children? It's very important you're listening. How did Moses see the unseen? He looked at the demonstration of a hand that was invisible, moving upon nature around him. Because what did I just read? Not by its own inherent energy does the earth produce its bounties and year by year continue its motion around the sun. You know, people study it. You've studied it in biology and in, in, in science, in school. They just think, well, that's all just going around. It has to. That's the way it is. Instead of realizing an unseen hand is constantly doing all this. And as your mind is tuned in, you will see God everywhere in nature. It goes on. And children, you've done it, haven't you? You've watched the little birds and their nests. Look at, look at what it says. A mysterious life pervades all nature. It lives in the insect atom which floats in the summer breeze. Have you ever looked up and seen, uh, you've seen those little webs floating along and at the end of them what's at the end of them floating high up in the sky a little spider they travel long distances guided by an unseen hand that wings like the the wings that flight of the swallow so the hand wings the flight of the swallow and feeds the young ravens which cry that brings the bud to blossom and the flower to fruit. The same power that upholds nature is working also in man. The same great laws that guide alike the star and the atom control human life. In him we live and move and have our being. We become part of the handiwork of God as we look in our mind to these things. It's such a bad interpretation to think that we have come from Mother Earth and to think that we have all evolved as everything around us has evolved. They do not acknowledge that they can actually see God instead of simply the things around them. They just want to give praise to the... Un How can we put it? It's just such insanity to think that it all just happens without a guiding hand. 
but there we see God. It goes on to say, the laws that govern the heart's action, regulating the flow of the current of life to the body, are the laws of the mighty intelligence that has jurisdiction of the soul. That's why I said to you last night, feel your pulse and think. Can you make that heart slow down? Can you make that heart speed up? Can you control that heart? Only God can. And this is what keeps me healthy, brethren and sisters, a deep appreciation that when my heart plays up, God can control it. Here it is. It goes on to say, From Him all life proceeds. Only in harmony with him can be found its true sphere of action. For all the ob objects of his creation, the condition is the same. A life sustained by receiving the life of God. A life exercised in harmony with the creator's will. That trans to transgress his law, physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to introduce discord, anarchy, ruin. To him who learns thus, to him who learns thus to interpret its teachings, all nature becomes illuminated. The world is a lesson book, life, a school, the unity of man with nature and with God, the universal dominion of law, the results of transgression cannot fail of impressing the mind and molding the character. Molding the character. Now, what did you just notice now? That you can actually find the reason for sin and what sin does in nature. It's just what I read. It speaks to you about everything that the Bible speaks to you about. But it is important for us to be in tune ourselves to receive those kind of messages. So may the Lord guide us and teach us while we are here in nature to occupy our minds at this, at this camp out to, to pay close attention and let our minds pick up God's thoughts to us first in the silence and when there is silence in your soul then you will be able to begin to think and see God speaking and you will see him working by his invisible hand. That's nature that God will speak to us through. May God help us is my prayer that we have picked up this important segment of God's voice working to our salvation. Amen.